might, uh, panelists, I'd like to ask a couple questions. Um, first of all, thank you, Paul, thank you, ask for this event. It has been great so far. Um, how many of you had a great experience with flying, but had really bad experience just purchasing a fair ticket? But you really enjoyed the flying, you really enjoyed the airline, you had great experience with the flight attendants, but you said, man, this is a great airline. But the, the way I got the ticket was so painful and time consuming process. Have you had that experience? Some of you have. So I had a really interesting experience last week. Um, uh, I have a 16 month old daughter and my wife wanted to go to Turkey. So I went to airlines website it's a pretty reputable airline, and I wanted to, you know, when, you, when a baby is less than two years old, you can get an infant ticket, uh, but you don't get a seat assigned, which was around, uh, this airline, this ticket was around $200 if I buy an infant ticket. But my wife said, hey, I don't want to, to fly all the way to Turkey almost, you know, 15, 16 hours with the connections and all that stuff. And, my baby, my daughter also loves eating, so she is a little chubby. So sitting, uh, <laughs> so my wife said, I don't want her to sit on my lap all the time. For so I wanted to buy a seat for her. So I go to the airline's website, um, and then I picked a flight to, to basically. And it's interestingly, whenever I add a, a child to the adult uh, ticket, Suddenly, my wife's uh, airfare actually ran up from $1,200 to $1,400 just because of I added a one more person to buy a ticket for. And then also, my daughter's ticket ran up from $200 to $1,200 because of a seat, which I was willing to pay, actually. I wanted to pay the, and purchase the ticket. So uh, I go to the website. I, uh, I pick a one adult seat one children's seat from age of two to 10. I said, purchase the ticket. Whenever I entered my daughter's age, the system wasn't giving me the ticket. It was because of the 16 months old, it was keep putting back to the infant and not uh, giving me the seat. Uh, so airline I think is gonna make almost what, almost additional $1,500 just because of I wanted to buy a seat for my daughter, right, in the scenario. So it said, okay, I need to call the airline. So I called the airline, uh, and then uh, I waited. I think it, it, this process took my whole morning time, over around four to five hours. I called the airline's uh, phone line, and I was on a hold around two hours. And at the end of the two hours, the airline representative said, sure, you can buy the ticket with us, but by the way, you need to pay us the fee. $25 for your wife and $25 for your daughter because of you buying, you're not buying from the internet. So, $50, I didn't mind spending an additional $50, right? When I'm spending over $2,500 for a ticket, but in principle, I just really didn't like it. So I spent another couple hours to reach a couple other levels and try to explain to them, you know, I want to buy from me, but the system doesn't allow it to. So it took almost five hours, so I was able to get to both seats, actually, both tickets. So in this scenario, if you notice, there are lots of services going on, right? We have a technology service through the website, which there is some small glitch, because probably if they hired some programmer to make a small checklist or checkbox, it will have fixed this problem. There's a business process problem because the, 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 the customer service rep probably has been told saying, hey, whoever buys a ticket online, you have to charge $25 regardless of the situation. There's a business process problem. There's a whole bunch of service issues actually. And then I was telling my wife, let's go buy a ticket to an airline. She's like, no, 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 I had a great experience with this airline. I want to fly with them. So it was kind of interesting situation. Anyway, I wanted to give you a scenario, there's a technology services, people services, business process services, and in today's uh, century, 21st century, we are still dealing with these simple issues, but it takes a lot of time for us, right? So um, in the first part of 
morning uh, panel actually. Uh, we have uh, representatives from industry, so I would like to invite them. Um, so we have um, uh, Anthony Bacaponso from uh, University of Industry Partnership. Yes, Anthony. So maybe what I what I was thinking is I can invite our uh, panelists. We can sit. We we all can sit here, and then. Um, I will give a maybe 10 minutes presentation, and then maybe each panelist will give you know, their uh, talk, and then we will have a discussion. So our next presenter is uh, uh, Niels Pil Piltman. Would you like to join us? We have Omar Reyes from Cisco. We have uh, Bob Rodio from uh, Siena. And then Deborah Stokes from EMC. So we can have some familiarity basics. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will just talk a uh, uh, couple minutes about opening up the services uh, panel, uh, and then we can continue. So uh, for, I've been in the services industry for a while. Uh, my my dissertation, PhD dissertation, was actually about software as a service models and pricing in uh, uh, around '96. Uh, uh, 95, 97 time frame. So, when, I don't want to spend too much time, but as you notice, these are the three big buzzwords happening today uh, about uh, growth of the services economy, growth of the service transformation of infusion, such as like uh, companies like the DuPont and some of the other manufacturing organizations are moving to the services. The third one is more technology orientation of the services about being service orientation. All right, and then Somehow, my slides looks different here than. Yeah, I like everybody not the technology service issue looks like you kind of chopped <laughs> off the top part of the slide. Anyway, so with this picture, I wanted to show. Um, how organizations are moving to the digital services. So a lot of organizations right now, from service orientation-wise, they are moving to the digital services. So top right corner, one of the projects I have done at actually Intel, which they were trying to move to the whole digital services. Bottom right is a financial service organization, actually from Arizona. They are also trying to move into the uh, digital services from services economy perspective. And then uh, with this picture, I wanted to show some examples. I know it's a little crowded, but I uh, uh, wanted to give you an example of some digital services, such as uh, Google and Nissan's uh, driverless cars. Uh, from a, Another one is a Tesco, which is uh, one of the grocery stores uh, in, 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 in UK, I believe, about how much uh, different services, in addition to the retail services, how much different services they are providing with technology enablement. In the left bottom corner, I have a few examples from uh, Disney, uh, General Motors, and AT&T, how each of them are um, going to the digital services. So the idea with this is all these different industries, such as retail, uh, such as you know, entertainment, such as GM, which is a, you know, one of the other manufacturing organizations, or telecommunication, they are actually trying to generate revenue from additional services, right, in addition to the, their core business model. Uh, and then we, we probably see these examples in all over the places, right, different organizations. I remember, like, you remember some of the healthcare, right? Uh, some of the healthcare organizations actually generating revenue from the hospitality services today. So, and then the enablement, or bottom line is basically, all these different organizations are trying to uh, create a new or uh, improved service offerings, processes, and service business models. So, um, I have a little crowd of one. So, what are the primary enablers, enablers of this digitization and digital services? Uh, so, uh, in the... We all know, I mean, most of us know, 
um, marketing actually discipline has been studying services for a while. I mean, from the consumer behavior perspective, right? In the last 20 years, probably, well, different disciplines joined the kind of started to work on the services area a lot. Uh, and then one of the major enablers, again, is the technology, right? Uh, bottom line is the why these digital services are happening is because of the, uh, you know, the explosion of the connected devices, uh, maybe advanced robotics, bandwidth, real-time analysis, and then uh, if the at the bottom side, I have social systems, cognitive service systems, and digitization. So, if all these things are happening, all these uh, technologies growing, all these different digitization is happening, there's uh, some trade-off issues happening also uh, from the customer perspective, right? Or the organizations. So on the left side, um, if there's a systemization versus customization, effectiveness versus cost, uh, consistency versus variance. So if the this digitization services are happening, service economy is growing, and on the other side, customers are expecting more and more services in a different form and format. So this is also creating some challenges and opportunities for uh, organizations. So from this, um, uh, we have panelists from these five organizations, so, and then uh, we, will, we will like to hear from each of them about their organizational and their personal perspective on how these services are evolving and what we may need to do right, in the in 21st century. 